Welcome to BBC News and a special program marking the fall of Kabul one year ago. Twelve months ago on this day, Taliban fighters swept into the heart of the capital. The Afghan army melted away. President Ashraf Ghani fled. The lightning advance by the Taliban was followed by a chaotic evacuation of desperate Afghans and foreigners. And the harrowing scenes from Kabul International Airport were a moment of reckoning for the West's two decade long engagement. Engagement here. Well, 12 months on, we take stock of what life is like in Afghanistan now. As well as Kabul, we're live in Kandahar. We'll hear from teachers inside and outside of the country with girls still barred from secondary education. We'll get the latest too on the security situation. We'll also get the view from our correspondents in Washington and also in Islamabad. We'll talk to a photographer and filmmaker who fled the country, their lives in exile and hear from some of those who've left but now have gone back. We'll also look at what the Taliban promised and what they've delivered in a country devastated by multiple humanitarian catastrophes. And as if a Taliban takeover wasn't enough, Afghans across this country are reeling from three years of punishing drought an economic collapse and growing impoverishment. Multiple crises hitting at this momentous time. We travel to the central highlands of Afghanistan, to the poorest and one of the most remote areas of this country, to see what the lives of Afghans are like now. Well, I'm joined now by the Afghan educator Pishtana Abduwani. He uh, joins me live from Massachusetts. Welcome here to the programme. Let me ask you, first of all, have your worst fears played out with uh, the end of secondary education for girls in much of Afghanistan? Pishtana Abduwani, thank you so much for joining us on BBC News once again. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Well... Taliban spokespersons are being constantly questioned uh, by international delegations, by journalists, about when the secondary schools will be opened. Our South Asia correspondent, Yugita Lamai, sat down with the Taliban's chief spokesperson, Zabi al Mujahed, and she put that question to him. When will the schools be open? Well, let's turn to the international response after that humiliating exit. The U.S. and the West have been grappling with how to deal with a country now ruled by the Taliban. Countries also in the region reassessing their approach. Uh, let's get the latest from our correspondent in Washington, Gary O'Donoghue. And Gary, after that catastrophic withdrawal with all the, the chaos, the confusion, the loss of life, I mean, that was a massive setback for the, the administration's early credibility, wasn't it? Interesting. Gary O'Donoghue live for us there in Washington. Thanks very much. Let's go straight back to Kabul and straight back to Lise. Uh, Lise, we were listening there to uh, the ramifications for the US, for the West, in terms of regionally, in terms of the reassessments from those countries around Afghanistan. Take me through it. Yes, well, the ramifications are arguably much, much larger, much more consequential for the neighbours and near neighbours of Afghanistan. They worry about any security threats. They, they watch very closely to see how this new Taliban authority is evolving. This Taliban, the Taliban in charge now, is very different from those of uh, the first time they were in power in the 1990s, at least when it comes to their ability to talk to the rest of the world. People will remember in the 1990s, only three countries recognize them, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. Now Taliban leaders, because they've got a travel waiver from the UN, they frequently travel to neighboring for, to cap capitals in this region, countries like China, Russia, uh, Iran, Pakistan. None of them have officially, formally recognized uh, the Taliban yet, but they certainly have interest here. They have allies here, as they have done in every stage of the war. And they watch how this new Taliban order is evolving. And that includes issues like how the Taliban are dealing with media. It has to be said that one of the achievements of the last two decades of international engagement here was an independent press, one of the most independent in this region. And now media watchdogs say that hundreds of Afghan media have been shut, either for political or financial reasons. Thousands of Afghan journalists have lost their jobs. 
let's just talk to two Afghan journalists to see what life is like for them. Here in Kabul, I'm joined by Ali Latifi, who is a freelance journalist, and we're joined from Toronto by Zara Nader, who's just launched a new Afghan media, Zan Media, Women's Media, working with Afghan journalists who are in exile and Afghan, particularly women journalists here in Afghanistan. Welcome to you as well, Zara Nader. So, so. So, Arnada, in Toronto, we, we wish you uh, the best. Ali Latifi, we're going to speak to you again later in the program. I'm going to hand back to Matthew now in London. Please, thanks very much. Uh, Lise, just let me ask you, uh, in terms of your reporting in Afghanistan, you first started uh, going to that country in the late 1980s. Since then, the Taliban took over. They were driven out. They took over again. Uh, what are your headline thoughts when you're there now and seeing what you're seeing? Every Afghan wanted to see an end to this punishing war, a war that's gone on for 40 years. Generations of Afghans have only known war. But the end of the war, the end of Taliban attacks, the US-led military operation has not led to a peace, has not led to a country where the majority of Afghans feel that it's a country that belongs to them, that the Taliban still don't represent the aspirations of the majority of Afghans. They say they do. They say they're giving the rights uh, of women and men, girls and boys with, within Islam. But in traveling across this country, no matter if I, we were speaking with un, you know, illiterate, uneducated farmers in the Central Highlands or educated women in the western city of Herat or here in Kabul, to a person, they all said that they'd seen some changes over the past 20 years, that they wanted uh, their country to progress, that they very much, this is an Islamic country, and they see what's happening in Pakistan, in Iran, in Saudi Arabia. And so they tell the, the new Taliban authorities here that they also want to see change. You can say perhaps the Taliban have just started, but they seem to be breaking the promises they made during the negotiations to say that the women would be able to work, girls would be able to educate it. Well, those, among other provinces, have been broken. Lisa, I'll be back to you in a moment or two. Thanks very much for the latest. Plenty more from Afghanistan here in the coming minutes. I want to just break away momentarily from that to bring you the latest from uh, Kenya's elections because we're just hearing in the last few moments that Kenya's Deputy President William Ruto has been declared the winner of last week's presidential election. He narrowly beat the opposition leader, Raila Odinga. Now, the head of the electoral authority was briefly actually prevented from declaring the results as scuffles broke out at the vote tallying centre. There was also controversy as more than half the commissioners from the electoral body held a press conference to say they did not agree with that final count and they've described the verification process as opaque. Now colleagues of Mr Odinga have complained about the vote count so all manner of ramifications since William Ruto has been declared the winner of last week's presidential election. That is uh, some of the latest that's coming in from Kenya. We'll be live in Nairobi here on the programme in half an hour's time. Now, you're watching this BBC News special a year on since the Taliban took over in Afghanistan. It is a country that has now changed in so many different ways. Even before the new regime, this was a country that was facing a humanitarian catastrophe. Hunger is prevalent everywhere. The economy is close to collapse. An earthquake struck only a few months ago. Crises piled upon crises. And when the Taliban have had to make difficult and at times controversial decisions, it has become increasingly clear that the real seat of power is not here in Kabul, but in the Taliban's ancestral heartland in the southern city of Kandahar. That's where the Taliban's reclusive and ultra-conservative emir, Haibatullah Akunzada, is said to preside. It is, the, it is this emir and his closest advisors who are said to be behind the decision to close uh, most most secondary schools for girls. So how has life changed in the past year in Kandahar? Our Afghanistan correspondent Sukundar Karmani joins us now. Sukundar, you have visited Kandahar so many times in the past five years. How different is it on this visit? Sukundar Karmani in Kandahar, thank you for joining us. Now. 
Let's talk about the security situation. I'm joined here in the studio by a security correspondent, Frank Gardner. And Frank, uh, your assessment of where we are with the security situation in Afghanistan. Frank Gardner, thanks for taking us through that. Now, let us spend the next section of this special program talking to some of those Afghans who've left the country and are now living in exile, and to some of those who actually had left and now have gone back. This is a profoundly consequential time for a generation of Afghans who are the most educated and connected generation in Afghan history. They came of age during the two decades of international engagement in Afghanistan. And for all the mistakes uh, committed both by the Afghan uh, authorities and by the international community, young Afghans were able to seize the opportunities, the jobs, the education that were afforded by the international presence here. With the fall to the Taliban, many of them have now fled and are struggling to make new homes in the West. But others have decided to stay and others went and have come back again, including uh, the woman who joins me now, an Afghan Canadian, Samir Syed Rahman. Samir, thank you very much for joining us. You used to work for President Ghani's administration when he brought lots of young Afghans into his government. Now you've come back to work with the International Rescue Committee and International NGO. Why was it important for you to come back? Mayor, I wish we had more time. Just thank you very much for joining us here in Kabul and here across Afghanistan and in many capitals. This is a day of profound reflection for so many Afghans around the world. More thoughts from you in a moment, at least. But uh, let's talk now to the filmmaker Sara Karimi, who's uh, former director general of Afghan Film, the body in charge of film and cinema in Afghanistan. She escaped uh, on the day the Taliban entered Kabul. She's waiting to talk to me uh, from Rome in a moment. But I want to play you first the moment she heard the militants were in the city. She'd been in a bank. She was ushered out the back, told to wait for a taxi, but then ran for her life. Sarah, the, uh, the line has just dropped out, so apologies, uh, the line there to Rome, uh, we're just losing, losing it there. Sarah Karimi talking to me there uh, live about being a filmmaker now in exile. Let's return to Kabul and to Lise. Yes, well, the rain has started falling here. That's good news for a drought-stricken uh, country. So this is putting a damper on today's uh, celebrations by the Taliban here in Kabul. Ali Latifi, the Afghan journalist who came back, is, is still with me. Ali, we saw how a new generation rose during that period of two decades of international engagement. Journalists are now coming forward to replace those who've left. Is it possible that a new generation can rise again? Ali, we wish you and other Afghan journalists a very safe environment to operate here in Afghanistan as you continue to try to report the news that matters not just for Afghanistan, but for many, many around the world. Lise, thanks very much. Now, the Afghan artist Fatima Husseini escaped from Kabul to Paris last August as the Taliban took over. She's spoken about the terror of that time, what she's lost, and her work photographing Afghan women in exile in France. She joins me live now on the programme from Paris. Uh, Fatima, thank you so much for being with us. How vividly do you remember the day that Kabul fell? Because I saw you write about seeing people running in the street and not being able to work out why they were running in the middle of August and then seeing the militants from your balcony. Well, a, a very, very powerful description and very, very powerful pictures. Fatima, we have to leave it there, but thank you so much for joining us uh, live on the programme from Paris. Let's go back to Kabul and let's go back to Lise. And Lise, I suppose 12 months on, there is a huge difference, isn't there, between gaining power and actually governing for the Taliban. Yes, it's still a huge challenge uh, for the Taliban to move from guns uh, to government. In some ways, they're still learning. And I remember from the very first days in August, when the first uh, chiefs of international aid agencies came to Kabul, senior Taliban authorities said to them, we need your help. We don't know how to do this. We don't have enough skilled Afghans. But a year on, with the international community still telling Afghans, you need to bring skilled people into the central bank. You need to get skilled people into the technical ministry. 
countries. Mainly the Taliban are still appointing their supporters. Raising the question which still hangs in the air, where is Afghanistan heading? This, these are profoundly painful days for Afghans who were forced to flee. Painful too for Afghans who are forced to stay. But there are Afghans who support the Taliban and there are Afghans who've decided to try to make this work despite all the obstacles. Let's just have a final thought from Samir Saeed Rahman, an Afghan can Canadian who came back and has decided to make this work. I ask everyone I meet uh, here, uh, Samir, if, you, if they see any hope, because many don't see any hope. Samir Saeed Rahman, thank you very much uh, for joining us here on a day when we mark the one year since uh, the Taliban took over Afghanistan again for a second time. It's a time of profound change, a time of fear, a time where Afghans dare to hope that lives will get better. Thanks for watching. Take away the noise. The fury. The fighting voices. The distortions. The cosmetics. The color and the flashy effects. But most of all, you can take away the lies. The slander. And the misrepresentation. That seeks to pull us apart. And then? And then. Then you can find out what's actually happened. And when you find that, then you'll find BBC News. This is BBC World News. I'm Matthew Amariwala. Breaking news on today's Global Kenya's Deputy President William Ruto is declared the winner of last week's presidential election. Following a delay after scuffles broke out ahead of the declaration, it was confirmed that Mr Ruto had narrowly defeated the opposition leader Raila Odinga. There are no losers. The people of Kenya have won because we have raised the political bar. Well, celebrations have started among Mr. Ruto's supporters. Also coming up in today's programme, it is 12 months on from the collapse of the Western-backed government in Kabul. In the last year, the Afghan economy has been in free fall, there's a humanitarian crisis, and the struggle for education for all continues. Perhaps the most significant change that the Taliban have made is that they barred girls from going to secondary schools in most of Afghanistan. It challenges the more moderate image they've tried to portray. Plenty more from Afghanistan in the next few minutes, but let's start in Kenya and the breaking news because in the past hour, the Deputy President William Ruto has been declared the winner of last week's closely fought presidential election. But the head of the Electoral Authority was briefly prevented from declaring the result as scuffles broke out amid claims of vote rigging at the tallying centre in the capital, Nairobi. Well, when the announcement finally came, the chair of the Electoral Commission said Mr. Ruto had won 50.49% of the vote against 48.85% for his rival, Raila Odinga. Mr. Odinga's coalition say they cannot verify these results. Well, addressing supporters, Mr. Ruto said there were no losers in the election as Kenyans have raised the political bar. Well... Let's get the very latest from our Deputy Africa Editor, Anne Soy, who's there in Nairobi. And, uh, Anne, uh, what are your initial thoughts, given what we've seen in the last 60 minutes? Anne Soy, live for us there in Nairobi. Thanks very much for all the latest. Thank you.
Now, let's return to Afghanistan, where 12 months ago today, the Taliban took control of the capital. The Western-backed government had collapsed and the world watched powerlessly. Well, the lightning advance was followed by the chaotic evacuation of Afghans and foreigners, the desperate images providing a moment of reckoning for the West. Well, let's begin our coverage this hour with this report from our correspondent in Kabul, Yigita Lamai. Well, a turbulent 12 months in the country has seen an economic crisis and a huge erosion of women's rights, with girls largely banned from secondary schools. Our chief international correspondent, Lise Tusset, is in Kabul and gave us a sense of the challenges facing the Afghan people. Sekundu Kamani there in Kandahar. Now, do stay with us because still to come on the programme, the faces and colours of Afghanistan's women. We speak to the female photographer who was forced to flee the country when the Taliban regained control. Welcome back to today's Global on BBC World News. Our main story this hour, Kenya's Deputy President William Ruto has been declared the winner of last week's closely fought presidential election. Now, Iran says Sir Salman Rushdie and his supporters are solely to blame for last week's attack in which he was stabbed multiple times. Tehran has also denied any involvement. The author remains in a critical condition in hospital in America, but can now breathe unaided. He's faced years of death threats for his 1988 novel, The Satanic Verses. A 24-year-old man has pleaded not guilty to attempted murder and assault. Well, speaking in Tehran, this is what Iran's foreign ministry had to say. Now, I want to end this hour with more on Afghanistan. A year after the fall of uh, Kabul, the Afghan artist Fatima Hosseini escaped from Kabul to Paris last August as the Taliban took over. Her work focuses on Afghan women living in exile in France. In the last hour, I spoke to her and she told me how she felt leaving her country that day. Well, that was Fatima Hosseini talking to me a little earlier. We'll have plenty more on Afghanistan, uh, the latest on the Kenyan elections too, in our next edition in 30 minutes time. See you then. This is BBC World News. I'm Matthew Emery Waller. On today's Global, Kenya's Deputy President William Ruto is declared the winner of last week's presidential election. Following a delay after scuffles broke out ahead of the declaration, it was confirmed that Mr Ruto had narrowly defeated the opposition leader, Raila Odinga. There are no losers. The people of Kenya have won because we have raised the political bar. We'll get the latest live from Nairobi. Also on today's programme, it is 12 months since the collapse of the Western Bank government in Kabul. In the last year, the Afghan economy has been in freefall, there's a humanitarian crisis, and the struggle for girls' education continues. Perhaps the most significant change that the Taliban have made is that they barred girls from going to secondary schools in most of Afghanistan. It challenges the more moderate image they've tried to portray. Hello and welcome to BBC News and we start this hour in Kenya where the Deputy President William Ruto has been declared the winner of last week's closely fought presidential election. But the head of the electoral authority was briefly prevented from declaring the results as scuffles broke out amid claims of vote rigging at the tallying centre in the capital Nairobi. 
Well, when the announcement finally came, the chair of the Electoral Commission said Mr Ruto had won 50.49% of the vote against 48.85% for his rival, Rayla Odinga. Mr Odinga's coalition says they cannot verify these results. Well, addressing his supporters, Mr Ruto said there were no losers in the election as Kenyans have raised the political bar. But we understand there is a system under, under deep state that will not allow you to be president, that will steal your vote. And I kept on assuring them that uh, I was the deputy president. If there was a deep state, I would know. If there was a system, I would know. And I think today... Uh, well, William Ruto there at that the news conference that uh, saying there that uh, the election shows that ultimately Kenyans are the ones that hire and fire governments, talking a little earlier about uh, laying out the agenda of uh, the immediate priorities that lie ahead and of course the cost of living crisis, corruption, two of the principal things that uh, his uh, administration is going to have to address. But uh, of course, before all of that, Rayla Odinga, he is is likely to put in a legal challenge given what we've seen in the last couple of hours but uh, uh, William Ruto has been declared the winner of the presidential election uh, despite the various challenges we are probably likely to see from the leader of the opposition those are the latest pictures from Nairobi more on this a little later in our program Well, before that, uh, let's turn to Afghanistan, where 12 months ago today, the Taliban took control of the capital. The Western-backed government had collapsed and the world watched powerlessly. The lightning advance by the militants was followed by chaotic scenes of the evacuation of Afghans and foreigners, the desperate images providing a moment of reckoning for the West. Well, in the last few months, life for Afghan civilians has changed dramatically, especially for women and girls. Our chief international correspondent, Lisa Set, has been to see how the Afghan people have adapted to life under this new regime. Sukunda Kamani, now do stay with us because still to come here on the programme, the faces and colours of Afghanistan's women. We speak to the female photographer who was forced to flee the country when the Taliban regained control. Welcome back to today's Global on BBC World News. Our main story this hour, Kenya's Deputy President William Ruto has been declared the winner of last week's closely fought presidential election. Well, let's stay with that story and go straight to our Kenya correspondent uh, live in Nairobi, Mercy Juma. And Mercy, uh, uh, where does this go now, do you think? Mercy, for now, thanks very much for that update. Uh, things very fluid there, so we'll keep an eye on that and bring you any more as it comes in. Now, the British government has described as ludicrous suggestions by Iran that Salman Rushdie and his supporters can only blame themselves for an attack which left the author severely injured. Iran has also denied any links to the man who stabbed the 75-year-old at a book fair in New York. Our North America correspondent Nomi Iqbal reports now from Pennsylvania, where Mr Rushdie remains in hospital. Now, let's return to Afghanistan and a year since the Taliban took control of Kabul. Many people have fled, others have left and then returned. Let's hear from a few of the voices that we've had on the programme today. Our chief international correspondent, Lisa Set, spoke to Samir Saeed Rahman, an Afghan-Canadian who's returned to work for the International Red Cross in Afghanistan. And she began by explaining why she decided to go back. Well, that was Samira Saeed Rahman talking to Lise. Others have fled Afghanistan and chosen not to return. I've been speaking to the Afghan artist Fatima Hosseini, who escaped from Kabul and went to Paris last August. Now, her latest work focuses on Afghan women living in exile. She explained what it was like leaving so suddenly last year after the capital fell. Powerful stories and powerful pictures from Fatima Hosseini talking to me a little earlier. That brings us to the end of the programme. Thanks to our teams in Kabul. And hopefully I'll see you at the same time for tomorrow's Global here on BBC World News. Bye for now. Hello there. The heat is finally abating across parts of Iberia.